This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter up above at the top of the screen at Backup Bradley and everything that we're talking about here. Okay, before we get started, I do want to make a couple comments. We're going to be opening up the Digital Perspectives Telegram group for a free joining. So you can join that group. Get in before this market pops. This is a really, really great group of people. No toxicity, right? The whole bit. Nothing that you like you find on Twitter. And remember, you know, um, there's a lot of really smart people in this space, and a lot of them are in that group. So I will put a link underneath of this video, and it will be a limited time that you can join that Telegram group. So make sure you get in on that link. Do not hesitate. The other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is I had someone send me a message and they brought up a really, really great point that I never hear anybody talk about. If you ever make an email change uh, and go with a different email and delete your email, make sure that you understand the implications of that when it comes to your crypto. OK, because I know a lot of people uh, are not really thinking about this. And I've had at least a couple contact me and tell me that they have had a nightmare situation because they deleted their old me email for some reason or another and then had trouble accessing their crypto because they got rid of their account and didn't think about how that could affect the access to that account. So if you're going to change or make an email change for any reason at all, make sure that you're aware of what you need to do with your uh, crypto on exchanges or anywhere else that you may hold it or wallet. So there we go. Now, also wanted to give a shout out to Hiding Out Now, who tells us that the uh, total circulating supply of XRP has gone up by 18 million. So we're going to get into that. Let's do the numbers really quickly. We have a lot to talk about today, and it's about the fact that I really do believe we really are on the precipice of getting ready to see XRP become a global stable coin. And I also believe that we're getting ready to see the Fed and other agencies adopt the definition of money to explicitly include virtual currencies. What does it mean for us? We're going to get into that. Bitcoin, $13,861.13. What in the world's happened? It was at 13 flat just a blink of an eye ago. That's how fast this market moves. Ethereum, $389.09, and XRP is $0.24. Cents. What is going on? Let's drill down on the numbers. 0 0.2413. The market cap is 10.9, almost 11 billion. The 24 hour is up 2.7%. The 24 hour number is 1.3 billion plus. And the total circulating supply is hiding out now. Said just came up another 18 million as it did last Monday, I believe it was. We are now at 45 billion, 284 million plus. That is is the numbers this morning so okay so now going on to the next thing here i want to keep this moving pretty quickly so because we want to get into these the back end of this today and really drill down on this because it's just amazing to me okay so let's go so founder of e-commerce giant alibaba jack ma is now supporting cryptocurrencies jack says the financial regulators in china and all over the world should embrace them so Pretty remarkable coming from Jack Ma. Shout out to him and everything they're doing, getting ready to IPO Ant Group, which could become the largest IPO to date in the world. Pretty remarkable stuff that's happening there. So after publishing its quarterly report the other day, Global Remittance Behemoth MoneyGram has seen its stock price soar from 26.28% within just one day from $4.80 to $5.80 on NASDAQ. Shout out to Michael Val Five Links. I wanted to make a point here because a lot of people have been seeing the money that Ripple is putting into MoneyGram uh, as a negative. And, you know, look, everybody's free to think what they want. My personal take on this is that I'm seeing money poured into MoneyGram for market development. And it's paying off. Look at the numbers. 
you know, they're partnered with them because they're innovating together. They're really creating these new products and services based on what Ripple can bring to the table for MoneyGram. MoneyGram's making the necessary adjustments and and uh, positioning and posturing to put themselves in a place to win because they're moving towards this digital embrace, right, of a new digital payment system, financial network, and all of that, and building out the products and solutions, whether it be back end or front end for their customers. So this is really exciting exciting what's going on and I see the money that uh, Ripple puts into MoneyGram as a huge positive here not a pay to play thing so all right moving on here the Starlink mobile app is now available for iPhone and Android. Well, this is interesting. If any of you have beta tested or tried this and, and had any success, please let me know. I am interested in uh, maybe becoming a beta tester myself here. This is pretty interesting stuff to have Starlink and 5G access potentially or on your phone or at least uh, Wi-Fi connection access running from Starlink would be a pretty remarkable thing to see happen directly on your uh, cell phone. So definitely let me know if you've tested or checked that out because I may do that as well. Okay, now we come into this. Now this is pretty remarkable from JMac here. I did it, wanted to just try it. I updated my PayPal app and there it was. Cryptocurrency is available and he put $5 on it. Go JMac, shout out to you. I don't know where or what part of the world JMac is in, but again, you know, here it is starting to unfold. And as we've heard Mr. Ahmed say, from PayPal, one of the next things to work on now that this is an offering is to begin to build out that offering so it can become really functional. So allowing you at some point to tie that into all the different payment systems that you may want to use it with. So it just gets bigger and better from here, right? All right, now moving into this global coin, global stable coin conversation and the idea that virtual currencies are money and the implications of what that could mean. We're going to get into that. Let's start right here with this really quick, less than a minute clip from Jeremy Allaire here talking about stable coins and their importance and then mentions a global stable coin as well. So here we go the FSB work, I think it's it's tremendously important. And First of all, he's talking about the Financial Stability Board, which we're going to talk about, and I've talked about plenty on this channel, but that's what FSB means and how important their work is, he says. And uh, I think it's a great development um, because, you know, what the market wants is clarity. What the market needs is what are the rules of the road? And so financial market participants, whether they be banks or fintechs or just companies that are going to do commerce mm -hmm. on the internet, they want to know, like, you know, how do we interact with this? What, mm -hmm. what, and, and in particular, global stable coins and right. global, oh. that's a, a, a defined term in, yeah. in, in this um, global stable coins that can, can work around the world and, and have the potential to be used really broadly. That's a place where, you know, you, you want to have consistency, right? Because they're global. <laughs> And there you have it. Well said by Jeremy Allaire. You want to have consistency because they're global. Absolutely. What he's talking about is the important work that was done on this document, as you can see right up here, regulation, supervision, and oversight, global stablecoin arrangements. Wow. Well, we've gone over this, and I tell you, I have a hard time imagining what else fits the definition of a global stablecoin, which is a jurisdictionless asset, which we've heard that terminology and verbiage be used by David Schwartz even, right? So, you know, it's pretty remarkable to me, but I just want to read to you uh, this little excerpt. I will put this PDF file in the comment section for all of you. And if you haven't seen uh, the previous videos, go to the search box in the video playlist and just put in global stable coin or anything that's uh, like the acronym FSB or G20 or G30. And I think you'll be awful surprised at the stuff that comes up in my video playlist. So on uh, 23rd of uh, 2020 in March, IOSCO published a report on global stable coin initiatives. We covered it here on the channel. The report includes a discussion at high level of how some of the relevant IS, 
IOSCO principles, standards, recommendations, and guidance could apply to global stablecoin proposals for purposes of the discussion on the IOSCO standards. The report used a hypothetical case study of stablecoin that could act as a global currency and potential financial infrastructure used for domestic and cross-border payments. Does this sound anything like you've heard before? Which uses a reserve fund and intermediaries to seek a stable price via a basket of low volatility currencies. <laughs> okay, that entire layout of that that defining of what a global currency could be is for cross-border payments, you know, uh, potential financial infrastructure, we have it, right? Looking at what they say, which uses a reserve fund and intermediaries to seek a stable price via a basket of low volatile currencies. Well, again, this is the Financial Stability Board, a regulatory body connected to the G20. This is the G30. This is a comment from Mark Carney. Listen to what he says about a global currency that could be used to replace the dollar reserve currency. Has raised the question of whether globally coordinated systemic hegemonic currency, not belonging to any government basically, could dampen the spillover shocks associated with dominance of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. A systemic hegemonic currency could, for example, be a stable coin backed by a basket of deposits at different central banks. Now, wait a minute, because it says right here, which uses a reserve fund and intermediaries to seek stable price through a basket of low volatility currencies. <laughs> This is suggesting that those intermediaries be central banks holding this basket of deposit of different currencies. It is possible that such a stable coin could be valuable for cross-border payments. Global currency potential infrastructure used for domestic and cross-border payments. Interesting. Because he goes on to say here, <laughs> serving a function similar to that offered in the private sector by Ripple, a real-time gross settlement system, currency exchange, and remittance network whose digital currency, XRP, leapfrog, slow and expensive correspondent banking. Boom. <laughs> Oh, brother, I tell you, you know, then there's this comment recently here from David Schwartz. Shout out to him and everybody at Ripple. According to Schwartz, XRP is being held back by regulatory uncertainty, last mile problems, and fear of backlash from existing banking partners. Well, then there's this. United States Federal Reserve has disclosed that it might be considering classifying digital currencies as a legitimate currency and or money. The recent proposal was from the Fed and FinCEN to expand the definition of money in their agencies to explicitly include virtual currencies. Well... This is interesting because Chris Brummer, shout out to Dr. Brummer, who we interviewed uh, for the film Cryptonaires, which, by the way, is now in its third round of rough edit process. It has really taken shape, ladies and gentlemen. I know that everybody's dying to see it. I'm dying for you to see it. But hang in there. It is coming. And I promise you, we are going to give you a great film and it will be worth the wait. Uh, this is a significant shift and would almost certainly accelerate the development and adoption of RegTech compliance solutions. And what is he talking about that could be an accelerant to the development and adoption of RegTech compliance solutions? Oh, that's right. 
that proposal to change the rule that money includes virtual currencies when it comes to the Fed. (laughs) Oh, boy. I have to tell you, you know, the plot thickens here. The plot really thickens here. And shout out to Dr. Chris Brummer because he has an amazing insight on this space. He has testified in the Congress. He has helped them ask the questions to be able to craft the right, right answers and the other right questions for drafting legislation. He's helped ask the right questions when it comes to identifying what these digital assets are and the implications of what they could mean, not only domestically here in the States, but internationally. And he sees it. Now, I want to take you and take you out on this here because I played one of these clips that I'm going to play for you just the other day. And this is Brian Brooks, and he's going to give you the playbook here. He's going to give you the playbook here about how to get a, how to get a CBDC done. Because you know what the playbook is? The playbook is, is that the Fed is not going to create a CBDC because they're not good at creating anything, just like the government's not good at creating anything. The plan is to adopt the stable coins that are out here by private companies like Paxos and USDC, right, and these things, and to bring a regulatory framework into place that can keep them regulated and keep them honest so they don't work outside of any Federal Reserve policy or government agency policy like the OCC and they can have oversight and they are free to go. And if they do that and if they exercise that plan of just simply bringing the regulatory framework in place to oversee these private issuers of stable coins to ensure that the reserves are there, the United States will absolutely move and leapfrog to the front of the fourth industrial revolution. Just like that. Don't believe it. It's still true. Let's listen to this first comment right here. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I I don't want to go too far out on this limb because I'm speculating a lot, but you can imagine a world where somebody builds an algorithm that purposely misstates the interest rate or purposely... um, you know, has a discriminatory component to it or, or purposely, uh, you know, is skimming a few cents off of every transaction and transmitting that to the token holders or something like that in a way that's not disclosed. If, if you discovered that, if you discovered that the software was in fact doing that activity, sure, you could go to whoever originated that platform and you can investigate whether they're the ones profiting from it and perhaps you could sue them. You know, maybe you could do that. But the point I'm making is that in an open source environment, once the initial version is launched, you know, as soon as the first set of changes are made, the initial people aren't necessarily responsible for what the software algorithm is doing. And so, again, I come back to the idea of that presents regulatory challenges. Now, there are a bunch of solutions that I've heard people talk about on this. Well, and he's getting ready to tell you what one of them are. And this is amazing to me because what he's talking about is how to deal with decentralized finance, okay? And how you deal with something that has no entity behind it. It's just a platform with an algorithm. And how do you deal with that if something malicious starts to happen on that platform? Well, listen to what some of the solutions he's hearing people discuss in the back end right here. One would be imagine a world where there was a central government blockchain and all other chains sort of connected to it. I'm sorry. Did you hear that? A central government blockchain and all the other entities attached to it. Now, Greg Kidd has referred to the XRP ledger as the universal highway. I know I do. That is the reason that the ILP was gifted to the W3C because of the interoperability in compliant and uh, I'm sorry, in um, in tandem with the XRP ledger, the way it works together to be interoperable with anything. I'm telling you, you know, I'm just a YouTuber, but, you know, I've said it before, I don't see the United States or any other entity interested in trying to chase down 6,000 plus coins 
that are in this market, knowing that 99% of them don't do anything. Or the fact that we've heard Brad Garlinghouse, he sees 99% of the coins in this space going away at some point. But I do see that the XRP ledger as a protocol, just like the internet protocols we have today, like TCP IP or whatever it is, and, and HTTP and uh, SMTP, right? You know, all of these different protocols, one for uh, email, FTP for file transfer, you know, HTTP for building uh, sites, right? You know, all these different protocols, but they work together as a federated system. I believe that the ILP and the XRP ledger become two of these elements that work together as the value protocols to begin to move value in tandem and to work with the other protocols of the internet becoming a part of that federated system so maybe it doesn't pan out just the way brian says here but nevertheless i still think it's an important point he's making now let me move to another time marker here at 34 right about here here we go well so but just to make a distinction so then would who would be the issuer would it be would it still be the central bank the so so the con i mean and he's asked she's asking who would be the issuer here of these private stable coins right and listen to what he says here Listen, I think most, most readers are familiar with the concept of the fiat-backed stablecoin. The binding constraint on the supply of fiat-backed stablecoin is the amount of dollars in circulation as determined by the central bank. So what he's saying is, is that obviously the private issuer is responsible for the issuance of a stablecoin. However, it is within them that they need to stay within the confines of not to issue a stablecoin for a dollar they don't have. Let's keep listening. But the stable coins themselves are not issued by the central bank. I mean, like Circle and Coinbase issue a stable coin, not the Federal Reserve. But that stable coin is issued with the promise that it's redeemable for a dollar, right? Same with all of these other fiat-backed tokens. So the Federal Reserve has the monetary policy role of determining how many dollars are out there. And by definition, you can't issue more stable coin than there are dollars in circulation because you can't sell the stable coin until somebody gives you the dollar. That's what I'm talking about, about regulators putting in place um, parameters and frameworks that say things like, how do I know at any given moment there are at least as many dollars in de on deposit as there are outstanding stable coins? Government needs to tell us that. Those are the kind of rules that government uh, does well. Oh, okay. So it sounds like what you're in favor of isn't actually how most people would define a central bank digital currency. That's exactly right, Laura. He doesn't see the Fed creating anything other than policy. And we just saw that they proposed to switch the policy to include the definition of money right here. That's right. Virtual currencies are money. That's the definition that's coming to the Fed, Laura. And the reality is, is I know that Laura does not a fan is not a fan of XRP or this overregulated situation. And I get it. The libertarian in me is not too happy about it either, but I also understand where the world's going to go at 49 years old, and it's not going to go somewhere that doesn't include the large entities that have been running this world all along. All right, so let's listen a little further here because Brian Brooks is about to explain to you that, yes, quite simply, we have Circle, we have Gemini, we have Paxos, all this stuff is out here. We already have it. We don't need the Fed to all of a sudden take to the developer side of things and start to construct a CBDC. And when, when, once this is actually uh, done, once this is actually announced, they, they change the definition of money, I think you get the SEC to say, hey, thank you for coming, but now virtual currencies are money and we don't need your help. So there's one agency right there that we don't need in the mix anymore because the definition of virtual currencies falls under money and the SEC deals with security. So thank you for coming. But we just took a couple agencies out of the mix and this whole ball of wax got a lot quicker to solve, which is why we saw Chris Brummer say it could definitely accelerate the development and adoption of RegTag compliance solutions. Listen to the rest of what Brian Brooks says here. 
Right. Well, that's my whole point is we have a choice in this country. The choice is, do we think the best way to digitize the dollar is to have a central bank digital currency, meaning uh, something built by the government on whatever time, with whatever features the government deigns to give us? Or do we think it's better for private innovators to develop different kinds of tokens that are fully fungible with fiat dollars, um, but they can be available yesterday? That, that, that's the choice that we have to make. Cool. The analogy I sometimes give, Laura, is, you know, the uh, the Federal Communications Commission has jurisdiction over telecommunications. Now, we could have chosen as a government uh, to have the FCC build cell phones. There it is right there. We're not asking the Fed to build the central bank digital currency because we didn't ask the FCC to build cell phones. And we could all have our government-issued cell phone, and they would all look the same, and they'd have whatever features the government wanted to give us. Or we could have an FCC that instead says, hey, here are the rules governing wireless telephony, but we're totally fine if Apple wants to build the iPhone and if Google wants to build Android phones. That's mm. totally fine, and they can all have different features, and they can respond to market demands. Uh, again, the role of the OCC and the Fed shouldn't be to build, at least in my opinion, shouldn't be to build a digital currency. It should be to do what the FCC did with phones. Tell us the rules that, fo that digital currencies have to apply sort of conform to and then let the market build what people want you know whoever's had a great experience with government produced product they should raise their hand but i think <laughs> generally speaking what we like in this country the beautiful experiences that get created in this country are created in the private sector with the government establishing rules perfectly said and brian brooks has got such a perspective for this it's just incredible to me but look, when you come back to this, this is an international effort, ladies and gentlemen. Let me go back to page one. You know, this is a document, by the way, I covered the day after it came out. It was came out this month on the, uh, the 13th of October. Um, but the reality here for me is this is an international adoption of new money. And that goes for digital assets alike, let alone the fact that I believe XRP is going to become a global stable coin. But the, the thing I want to leave with today is the idea of understanding that is the U.S. behind? You know, Brian Brooks will tell you yes. But what I say is no, because I see them getting the definition of money to include virtual currencies. I see them revealing the fact that if they change that definition, it eliminates certain regulatory agencies from having to chime in at all. I also see the fact that the U.S. is the largest economy in the world. And if they simply bring the regulatory framework to overlay over top of the private stablecoin issuers that are already in play, we have a CBDC. It's just simply a digital dollar. And as long as they adhere to federal policy and don't get out in front of that, I think we're off to the races right out of the gate. Now, with that being said... There has been a lot of talk from the IMF. There's been a lot of talk from other entities around the world and other countries that are tired of the U.S. dollar being the global reserve currency. A few months ago, I covered the IMF having a webinar where Barry Eichengreen, who was on Blockstars with David Schwartz, who spoke about the fact that there was a Triffin dilemma in the 21st century with the U.S. dollar, and we need to deal with the fact that the U.S. dollar's dominance is harming what is going on in, in an international way. So that webinar was really about the debasement of dominant currencies like the U.S. dollar. I propose that if the U.S. understands that the rest of the world is ready for, at the very least, a debasement of the U.S. dollar, as Brad Garlinghouse has mentioned, because of all the printing, if we are at the most going to see the dollar lose its global reserve currency, wherever you are on that spectrum, the impact is great no matter. But it would make sense to me if the U.S. is aware of either one of those two things or anything along that spectrum of debasement or losing its global reserve status. I think it would be in the U.S.'s best interest to know that they would go last in the launching of this new digital asset world we're about to live in, making and ensuring that all other nations have done the work, the development, the market infrastructure, and the updates to show that they are committed to this new system 
So the U.S. is ass ain't hanging out to dry here and losing the global reserve status and possibly facing a debasement and then being last in the uh, digital race, too, of the fourth industrial revolution. I don't see it. What I do see, however, is something very similar to what Brian Brooks is talking about and releasing a regulatory framework that encompasses private issued stable coins to serve as a digital dollar operate within policy and framework, and we are instantly at the front of the line of the fourth industrial revolution. And with the expansion of money to explicitly include virtual currencies here domestically in the States, I don't think it'll be long when we look at this international PDF file that's right in front of us that shows that the world's ready for it as well. I believe XRP will become a global stablecoin. All right, that's going to do it for me. Before I get out of here, I did want to give a quick shout out to iTrust Capital, who absolutely is just tearing it up in their world with the IRAs, crypto IRAs, gold IRAs, and and now the most technologically advanced uh, physical silver IRAs, people. This is pretty remarkable. Make sure you check out what they're off. It's just $2.50 over spot per ounce. You cannot beat and you will not find a better company offering crypto, gold, or silver IRAs on the planet. There's no doubt about it. They got the best deal going. Make sure you check them out and they're really great people. That's going to do it for me. Hit the like and subscribe. Make sure you share with somebody you know and check out all the links in the description box in the comment section. There's currently right now a 60 plus percent discount for the pure VPN. Help hide your anonymity online and get a really great deal in the process. All right, I'll catch all of you on the next one.